Hey, church family, what an amazing week that we have had. I hope that all of you had an opportunity to check on on some of what's gone on on Camp Week. Um, Camp 3D uh, that high school was doing in the evenings and during the days was just uh, fantastic. Perry and his team did an amazing job making waves the middle school camp. Leah and her team did an amazing job of putting things out there and collecting kids and, and making it really uh, special. I was, I was grateful that we could be a part of that. Kat and her team, a Christmas in July for Club 45ers. And um, in VBS, Melinda and Sarah, you guys did a great job. I am so grateful for what you guys were able to do this week. I just want to say thank you, just starting off today, to all the staff. Uh, and the volunteers who made all of Camp Week happen. Um, it was so great to see families connected and doing what they normally do in this world um, uh, with their kids. Um, what, a, what a great moment. What your family ministry staff to, did to pull this together over the last month and a half was nothing short of amazing. They did an amazing job and deserve um, all the praise that, uh, that they, they, they need for, um, for what they did. I also want to say um, a special thanks to our AV and our tech team. Uh, since COVID, they have been pressed into service in a way that is unreal, um, super significant, and they have remained flexible and available to the folks that have needed them, the hours of things that have fell to the cutting room floor because they didn't make it or because we're just not good actors um, was, uh, is, just, is just huge. And so I really just want to say a special thank you to Kenzo and Seth and Michael and Emil and Nader and the others who put in extra time uh, to make all of this happen. They're making this happen right now um, that you're able to join us uh, in worship. What a, what, a, what a thing. So thank you, thank you, thank you for all you have done and all you continue to do in these moments. Uh, at our VBS, we learned an important reality that we can trust Jesus in all aspects of our life. We trust Jesus to set the direction of our life. We uh, allow Jesus to teach us and remind us of how we're supposed to live and to keep us humble. Uh, that's what our scripture is about today. We'll be looking at Proverbs chapter 21, uh, verses 2 through 4. If you are able, would you stand for the reading of God's word? A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. To do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Haughty eyes and a proud heart, the unplowed field of the wicked produce sin. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, you've given us this day to come, to rest, to worship you, God, and we lift up our hands in praise saying thank you for what you've done in our families this week. We ask for your presence right now in everyone's home, their apartment, wherever they are. God, that they might hear your word come off of the page and alive in their experience like never before. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing in on our series on truth and wisdom. And this week we are talking about justice and righteousness, both of which are central to the heart of God, as well as difficult for us to practice. But I hope that the passage today gives us some insight on how we can do that. A few years ago, I remember I was taking my daughter out to ride her bike, and it was that moment that, um, that we get excited about, and that is the moment that we were getting ready to pull her training wheels off of the bike. And I remember her saying to me, uh, Daddy, I really want my wheels off, and I want to get off and go ride like you do. And so I took the training wheels off. And as I did... We ran alongside of her and, and, and held that seat. And anyone who has taught a kid how to ride or even watched a kid ride for the first time without training wheels, you know when you let them go, uh, they head out. 
and they're riding, but man, they're wobbly. And wobbly so much so that a wrong tilt of the head one way or the other is going to knock them over. And I think um, that is not what I would actually call straight. Um, what we did and what my daughter did was absolutely all over the place. But this is what she said to me when she got off her bike. She said, Daddy, I was really going straight. When we look at verse two, verse two, excuse me, we know that that is what God is trying to tell us. God would say that every path of a person is straight in their own eyes. But it's God who actually weighs the heart of a person. See, everyone looks at their own path as straighter than they should. It's true in my life. I know it's true in your life. It's true for almost every person that I know. When we look at our lives, we tend to think that we've operated with more integrity or more virtue or better information. We tend to think that we are generally good. But here's the point of the verse. You and I do not get to decide about the straightness of our path, the integrity of our heart, or the virtue of our actions. Only the living God weighs the heart. Only Yahweh weighs the heart. Here's another way to put it. We judge ourselves by our intentions. I believe that most people in the world get up in the morning and intend to have a good day. For many people, they intend to have a great day. For the most part, we don't want to step out into our day and be angry or be frustrated or hurt other people. Our acting senior pastor, Jeff Matisich, talks about this when speaking to staff, when they first come on board, asking us to believe the best in one another. And I'll get to that later. This is true. Though our intentions may be good, we can miss horribly and really, really hurt each other. Years ago, when I was working at another church, for the most part, I thought that things were going well. I had a great team of volunteers and God was doing some really amazing things. God was moving in the lives of kids and in the lives of our staff. And I was pretty pleased with what was going on until, until I got a letter. This letter was from one of our volunteers. And uh, one of the volunteers that I've been working with um, and that volunteer outlined a bunch of places that um, I had been insensitive, had outlined a bunch of places where I had been inattentive and generally dismissive to that person. I took that letter and I initially dismissed it. And you see the problem. However, I was grateful that not only did God judge my heart, but God brought that judgment to my attention and convicted me so as to teach me to be a better follower of Jesus. See, when we look in scripture, we can find places where God weighs a person's heart. Uh, King Saul got weighed and found to be wanting. King David got weighed and was a person after God's own heart. Mary was weighed and found to be Worthy of carrying Jesus. The rich young ruler was weighed in his own heart by the words of Jesus. The hope is that we see ourselves rightly. The way that God sees us. The way that God weighs us. When we allow the Holy Spirit access to our hearts. And we are connected to God. A few things happen. One. God makes us aware of our need. God also provides a new vision of how we are to live. Three, God gives gifts and abilities for us to live out that vision. And four, God gives guidance and strength and motivation for that thing. When we are connected to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit access to our heart, the Holy Spirit empowers us to go and do the thing that we are being called to do. 
When we begin to live in the light of what God believes about us, we can accomplish what God requires from us. Verse three, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. I stated earlier that righteousness and justice are central to the heart of God, as well as difficult for us to practice. In this verse, we learn about the relationship to sacrifice. Righteousness and justice are more valuable than sacrifice. That's not to say that sacrifice is worthless. It says sacrifice without righteousness and without justice are worthless. Sacrifices cannot hold up to what God wants from us. And that's the higher order of righteousness and justice. This is not the only place where that is abundantly clear. We find that in Isaiah chapter 1 verses 11 through 17. We find it in Hosea chapter 6 verse 6. We also find it in Micah chapter 6 verses 6 through 8. Not just 6, 8. We had to back up to verse 6. Let me read it for you. With what shall I become, excuse me, with what shall I come before the Lord? And bow down before the exalted God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn of my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. The practice of justice and righteousness would include, but not be defined by offering sacrifices. But what does that mean to practice these? Uh, Psalm 89, 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Jeremiah 9, 24 says, But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. It's not just a proverbial statement or a mention in the psalmist's praise, but is a recognized, it's recognized as a statement about God's character from the mouth of God. Let's take a look at these. At one level, these two words are used interchangeably, both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. Their difference is much more clear in the Old Testament than it is in the New Testament, but their nuance is carried throughout and is significant. So I hope you can follow me as we talk about righteousness and justice. We're going to talk about righteousness first. In the Old Testament, righteousness is much more tied to fulfilling the obligations of a relationship rather than being pious or adhering to moral norms. It means conducting yourself and ourselves in such a way that honors the relationship with God, the relationship with your spouse, relationship with your parents, relationship with your children, your grandparents, your friends, your colleagues. Sometimes these are really hard to assess. When in a wedding ceremony, people say, for richer or for poorer, what do you really mean by that? How do we really qualify that? At Lake, uh, at Lake Avenue Church, we have four expectations that are a part of how we conduct ourselves as a staff. It's part of our ongoing training. It's what I alluded to in the beginning, what Jeff talks about. And here are the four. Number one, be an adult disciple. Meaning, we need to act like adults and in our discipleship continue to treat each other like adults. Number two, deal with conflict in real time. 
making sure that the conflict that we have, the conflicts that come up in normal day-to-day, every day, that we deal with them immediately. And immediately may mean uh, a day or two later, but make sure that we're dealing with those things in an appropriate time so that we don't let time go by without repairing the relationship. Number three, assume the best in each other. As we come knowing that we're all followers of Christ, We've got to know that we got up in the morning hoping that we were going to have a great day. And whatever has happened during that day or even in the nighttime that stressed us out or brought us to that place, we've got to assume that people didn't want to hurt us. And four, remember the fullness of our flock. I think that's really important that we remember the breadth of who we are as a church. Uh, Pastor Greg uh, had a sermon a few uh, uh, months ago, I think, um, that was talking about how we are a purple church. We're not a red church. We're not a blue church. We're a church where people come to follow Jesus. And that's the baseline. And God's going to continue to work in us so that we become his people, this unexpected family. In order for us to be righteous, in some, in some ways, we need to fulfill our obligations to each other. I would also suggest that these expectations would be lived out in the whole of our congregation and not just the staff. In Christ's words, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you as well. Matthew 6.33 Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Our obligation is to God and to each other. Love God, love each other. Let's talk about justice. In the Old Testament, justice is related to obligations just like righteousness is but it's shaded to a quantifiable or legal or forensic meaning. You could think of it as a measurable righteousness. Uh, Justice concerns itself with integrity of our systems, economic, educational, professional, judicial, and the like, to provide access to resources and support reconciling claims in such a way that promotes shalom. It's Not about revenge, but promoting wholeness. That is the wellness of the community, the well-being of the community, the shalom of the community, especially for the most vulnerable. I appreciate the words of Brian Stevenson, the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, who says, we are all implicated when we allow other people to be mistreated. An absence of compassion can corrupt the decency of a community, a state, a nation. Fear and anger can make us vindictive and abusive, unjust and unfair, until we all suffer from the absence of mercy and we condemn ourselves as much as we victimize others. The closer we get to mass incarceration and extreme levels of punishment, the more I believe it's necessary to recognize that we all need mercy, we all need justice, and perhaps we all need some measure of unmerited grace. In order for us, Lake Avenue Church, for the church universal, To become more just, we need to make sure that the systems and organizations that we are involved with are promoting those realities. The realities of God's kingdom, the realities of justice, the reality of providing resources and support for reconciling claims. In Christ's words, seek first his kingdom and his justice and all these things shall be given to you, Matthew 6.33. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of justice. If you're paying attention, you'll note that I 
use those words interchangeably. And you'll remember when I said at one level, these two words are used interchangeably both in the New Testament and the Old. Their difference is more clear in the Old than it is in the New, but the nuance is significant. This is what I'm talking about. The words Jesus uses can be translated justice or righteousness. Not necessarily so in Proverbs or Jeremiah, but the nuance is still there. But here's the thing. We cannot be righteous people if we are not seeking justice. And we cannot be just people if we are not seeking righteousness. I want to say that again because I think it's really, really important. We cannot be righteous people if we are not seeking justice. And we cannot be just people if we are not seeking righteousness. Because God has brought the church into existence to be a community in which love for God and love for each other are the expectations of our life together. Here are the things that I think we need to be doing that in order and to practically pursue righteousness and justice. I want to talk about righteousness first. Here's five things that I think are really important for us to do. Vulnerability is really important. We've got to be vulnerable with one another. We've got to engage in fellowship. Not just hanging out with one another, but seeking Christ in one another. We have to be accountable to one another in our lives. We have to have good conversation. We've been talking about that a lot in our civics. We've got to have good conversation, not only in civic life, but in our theological life as well. And more importantly, and most importantly, we have to love. Not just expect love, but we have to love. Here are the things that I think that we need to do to pursue justice. We need to assess people's needs with people who share that need. A lot of times we assess the need for other people without inviting their their input. We need to brainstorm opportunities to meet that need. We need to choose a course of action. We need to gather resources and we need to implement a plan. These are things that a lot of the organizations and the churches that we are a part of are doing and we need to just continue to do that. Find your cause for justice and engage it. Verse 4. Haughty eyes and an arrogant heart. The lamp of the the wicked are sin. This verse is quite clear and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Pride is not the best for keeping yourself or others inside of God's grace. Pride or putting yourself first leads to sin unequivocally all the time. We're called to live in contrast to sin and pride. Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right, righteous spirit within me. Psalm 131.1, Lord, my heart is not proud, my eyes are not haughty. It is only in humility that we are able to see ourselves. It is only in humility that we are able to keep ourselves from pride and the sin that so easily entangles us. The series is Truth and Wisdom. And this is what I know from today. Is that when we recognize that our impact on others is a greater indicator of how well we are following Jesus, more than our intention, we know something truthful about us and we have gained wisdom. When we recognize that trusting Jesus is tied to our, patient, our practice of righteousness and justice, we know something truthful about us and we have gained wisdom. When we humble ourselves so that we are not caught in entanglements of sin, we have gained something truthful about us and we have gained wisdom. When we do that, the straightness of our path, the integrity of our heart, The virtue of our actions will fall in line with the truth, the wisdom, and the power of the living God. Amen and amen.